I'm drawn to natural spaces, mountain uh, green spaces, mountain hikes, parks, gardens. They restore my soul by combining walking, worship, meditation, harmony, where the inner state of my soul is in tune with the outer state of my environment. I like making connections. I'm a five on the Enneagram. That's, I mean, that's, that's my happy place, making connections. My heart and my joy find great excitement in them. The problem with meditating on scripture is that you start making one connection and then another and another and another and another and another and another. another. So as we've been um, preaching through 1 Peter, as Peter's been preaching through 1 Peter, we take those same scriptures and we meditate on them in sacred space. And this one has really been gripping me from 1 Peter 4, 6. So I'm not going to show it. Uh, that though we are judged in the flesh, the, we are judged in the flesh the way men are, so that we might live in the spirit as God does. It's like, wow, what are you saying, Lord? And so that starts making connections, and I start going through the, the mission of Jesus, and I settled on this passage that I have today, and that's making connections in Luke uh, 22 with Jesus in the garden. And that's making connections with all of Luke, the mission of Jesus, Isaiah. And after three sermons and, and writing three sermons, it's like, this is just too many connections to hold on to. It's too hard to follow. So I scrapped them all. And uh, yeah, I scrapped them all. And now I'm lost. <laughs> So, um, just trying to figure it out. I've actually just jumped in this thing. Anyway, so I, sent, I spent some time in centering prayer. Just put the sermon aside. Went back to reading this passage we're about to read three times. And uh, sat in silence. And then I went for a walk. And I just paid attention to what was the Lord praying in my heart. And that's what I'd like to share with you this morning. So here's the events leading up to this scene in Luke 22, 39 to 42. Jesus has been really looking forward to the Passover with his disciple before he suffers. He never really asked anything for himself, and he's, but he's really been looking forward to this. We call this Passover, this particular Passover, the Last Supper. You're probably familiar with that. At the end of the supper, an f- argument breaks out over who's going to betray Jesus. And then they, they, they argue over that, and then they dispute over who would be the greatest among them. So Jesus has to give them a lesson about the greatest, must become the servant of all. And then he announces that he wants to assign to them a kingdom, just as his father has assigned to him a kingdom, that they may eat and drink with him and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Then comes Jesus' warning to Simon that the Satan demands to have you, to sift you as wheat. But Jesus prays for, Jesus prays for Simon that his faith will endure. <laughs> But Simon says, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready to die with you, Jesus. I'll go to prison with you, you know. Whatever it is, I, I'm in. Uh, and then Jesus warns him, yeah, Peter, before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And then, Peter, then Jesus instructs him to bring a knapsack and a money bag, and there's a couple of swords, bring those, and so that scripture could be fulfilled. And it's like, yeah, what do we do with that? Uh, we're not going to go there. Um, but... Apparently, they need a refresher course. Jesus has already taught them, you don't need these things. He sent them out before without money bags and purse or sandals, and he's provided for their needs. They go out without weapons of protection, and God protects them. So this is a refresher course that coming under stress, with these things right at hand in your grasp, are you going to fall back into them, or are you going to lean into and follow me? So that's an upcoming temptation. Well, has that ever happened to you? Where things that you kind of, yeah, I, I kind of settled that in the past. Yeah, <laughs> happens to me, happens a lot. It's like, oh, I don't need that. You know, on the good days, I'm, I'm kind of rising above it all. On the bad days, it's like, oh, yeah, here we are again. So I'd like to read together Luke 22, 39 to 40. This is the message I'd like to focus on today. And Jesus, he, Jesus, came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray, that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, 
And he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So I want us to walk away with the answer to three questions this morning and an invitation. Why do we need holy habits? Why did Jesus tell us, pray that you may not enter into temptation? And three, what's in the cup? So let's turn back to our text, Luke 29 to 39 through Luke 22, 39 to 40. So why do we need holy habits? Well, if you've read any of Dallas Willard, you will have been introduced to the concept that the will is not very powerful. The will is, however, highly effective in choosing to develop new habits. Over time, habits literally rewire the brain, creating a body of character. Bad habits work in the background against you leading into destruction time and time again. However, holy habits are another story. They work in the background for you, leading you in the way you desire to go so that you don't have to continually be fighting the same battles over and over again. Your default mode becomes doing the good, the wise, and the beautiful thing before you're even aware that you're doing it. Being kind, expressing gratitude, loving mercy, doing right by people, being honest, being faithful. These desires of the Spirit get worked into our human condition, into your brain, into your body, and into your soul. You enter into an upward spiral of human flourishing. For me, going into the garden looks like this. When I was in my teens, I was in a habit of taking long walks at night, singing sad songs of unrequited love that expressed my desire for connection with another soul and with God to deliver me out of the painful loneliness and meaningless of life. In my college years, I added worship and prayer meetings to my habits, which have endured through the years, um, giving my soul a large body to draw from, connecting my emotional life to my body in just about any circumstance or emotional state. Joy, fear, love, discouragement, gratitude, uncertainty, whatever. I can enter into that emotional state with song because I'm not just thinking about it, I'm actually speaking it. And not just speaking it, but actually singing it. It connects me to those emotions which otherwise kind of lay hidden under the surface. When I can sing, I get out of my head, and I actually feel. I'm no longer alone in my feelings, but I'm experiencing them with God. Not just the good stuff, but all of it. In my late 30s, I was introduced to the Jesus prayer and practiced it until it became second nature. It became a frequent habit of being still and being drawn into silence with God, communing spirit to spirit. It doesn't matter which door you get into the van from or which seat you sit in. The important thing is that you get in the van because that's where Jesus is. Get into the habit of getting into the van. Walking, worshiping, attentive silence have become a single integrated habit of following the Lord into the garden. So here's what I do. I interrupt whatever important thing I'm doing to maintain the space-time continuum because if I'm not busy, of course, it will decay without me. Or whatever time waster I happen to be twiddling away my life with. I go outside and walk. I don't listen to music. I don't listen to podcasts during this time. I don't listen to sermons. I don't come up with an agenda. I don't come up with a list of ought-tos. I don't come up with a list of instructions for how God can fix the universe. I don't come with a desired outcome even for what I want out of that prayer time. I just do a quick temperature check. Am I going to be too hot on the cold before I go for a walk? Where I walk doesn't matter. I have a few routes I tend to fall into by custom. I pick whatever I, one I happen to feel drawn to when I get to the end of the driveway. And I'll go left or right in the moment. I take a step or two down that route, and usually a song of adoration arises, usually Jesus or holy. 
Or sometimes it's just the worship du jour that's sort of been running through my brain as I've walked around the house that morning. It's been my custom to join Sunday worship, uh, well, pretty much since I was about a week or two old. And uh, so I have a lifetime of music and worship songs to draw from, at least half-remembered songs. And a lot of them I've just made up the words, so yeah, that's good. Uh, But usually a short phrase or song will settle in and it becomes a sung breath prayer. As I walk, it will fall away into silence. I will walk with the Lord in that silence. We might have a conversation. We might sing together. We might just walk in silence. I usually feel worship welling up in me. I drink, rinse, repeat. And then uh, usually that takes about anywhere from a half hour to three hours. So praying in the same manner with the centering prayer and the Jesus prayer took more practice for it to become second nature when I was sitting down indoors. But I sit down, get comfortable, and let the rhythm of my breathing, the rhythm of my heartbeat, replace the rhythm of the walking. In this silence, with, uh, there's no music in the background. I've been doing Jesus, the Jesus prayer for decades, so now it usually just starts on its own. Sometimes I just say Jesus, and it draws me in. And I let it fall away, taking it back up as I'm drawn to the thoughts about this or that, or concerns or worries or insights. I just return to, to Jesus and let that gently, ever so gently on my lips until it falls away into silence. And I enter with him into the garden. Sometimes a short verse or a scripture or a song or a previous prayer will become that breath prayer. I don't demand what form it takes. I just I hold on to it lightly and I let go of it lightly. What is essential in prayer is a quiet, loving, and attentive spirit. Feel free to experiment with whatever setting, activity, or technique, or things that help you with nurturing a quiet, loving, and attentiveness in your soul. The hero's journey is not one who desires to rise above all others but the one who abides in union with the all in all. Set your eyes on Jesus. Set your desires on Jesus. Set your treasure on being with Jesus. Set your habits on following him. Habits on being attentive to him. Walk where he walks. Stop talking at God and let your heart be attentive to what the Spirit is praying in you. Be still. Listen. Listen to him praying in your garden. Stay awake. Stay attentive. And let your prayers become one with his. Be attentive. When you see Jesus entering into the deep places of the garden of your soul, develop a habit of following him. So why do we need holy habits? Customs build a body of habits that become our character. Our new, our new default behavior. Our habits start working for us rather than against us. Jesus had customs, habits, of going into the temple, withdrawing to be alone to pray, and the habits of going to the Mount of Olives. The disciples had a custom of following him. You don't have to fight the battle each time. Oh, am I going to go pray now? Am I going to go to church? Am I going to say in church? Set my desire on the right thing. It just becomes second nature. It's it's what you do. Well, what about pray that you may not enter into temptation? If God doesn't want us to enter into temptation, then why do we need to pray? Why do we pray, give us our stay our daily bread and lead us not into temptation? James 1, 13 to 14 says this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So why then does Jesus teach, have us pray, lead us not into temptation, if God is not 
has no intention of leading us into temptation. Well, I'd like you to think about temptation not as a list of do's and don'ts, but this. Temptation is trying to do the work of God apart from the Spirit of God. Whenever God has given us a task or assignment, we're tempted to crank it out in the flesh. That's the temptation. God is leading you on a journey in order to prepare you to receive a kingdom, but your heart's not ready for it. The Old Testament, actually all of human history, is a tragic uh, cautionary tale of what happens when we receive power and authority before we have the character to walk humbly with God in it, doing justly and loving mercy. Unless the desire of the Spirit is worked into you, giving you holy desire, and that holy desire is worked into remapping your habits, your brain, your body, the entirety of your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, the whole manner of your life, you will be tempted to use all gifts, power, and authority to fulfill the desires of the false self. Then the gifts you receive from God will become a curse to you and everyone around you. We pray, lead us not into temptation because our wills are not free, but they're captive to sin. The one who sin is a slave to sin. This is the human condition of trying to live independent of God's presence and seeking to steal God's kingdom before, before we are ready for God to lovingly share it with us. Now, you don't need to figure out all the psychological, neurological, and spiritual principles behind this. They might be helpful, but here's the key. Be attentive. Be awake. Praying is being attentive and giving consent to God's presence and action within us. I'll say that again. Prayer is being attentive and giving consent to the Spirit's presence and action within us. Set your mind and heart on God, and you will not enter into temptation to live apart from the presence of God in you. You will choose the path he leads you in instead. Pray and you will be led by the Spirit rather than led by the programs of the false self to resist, deny, and betray the love and lordship of Christ in your daily heart, your daily mind, your daily actions. You will be delivered from captivity to the evil one and delivered into the true liberty of the Spirit in Christ. Now, please hear me. Stop trying to fix yourself with the tools of the false self. Stop using the punishment and shame of, and the reward of taking pride in your virtues to improve your behavior. Shaming yourself not to do this, taking pride in doing that. Behavior management is not the goal of the spiritual life. Holy habits, spiritual disciplines are not the goal of the spiritual life. Holy habits or spiritual disciplines are the means to help you effortlessly follow Jesus into the garden and pray with him. The more you are with him, the more you will desire to be with him above all else. That's the goal. Be attentive. When you see Jesus entering into the deep places of the garden of your soul, follow him. Pay attention to what Jesus is doing. And above all, the spirit of love and humility in which he does it. Do life with God rather than for God. Luke twenty two forty one to 44. And he, that is Jesus, withdrew from, about, withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. And nevertheless, not my wills, but yours be done. And there appeared an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And he began in agony. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And the sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. We are not going to stir up 
a lot of angst and agony this morning. That's not, that's not the goal of this sermon. And it's not, not really the purpose of Lent either. But I want us to consider what's in the cup. The predominant Western view of how God judges sin in the flesh is called satisfaction. It comes out of medieval times. The sinner must be made to suffer conscious torment until the debt owed to God's honor is satisfied. But this debt is so great, it's impossible for man to fulfill. But being merciful, God puts Jesus in our place, turning his back on Jesus, the perfect son of God, and punishes him in our place. Being perfect, equal with God, the need for infinite retributive justice is satisfied in the temporal punishment of Jesus, the Son of God. This made perfect sense to the medieval mind. The scales of divine justice have been balanced. For Western Christians, this is what Jesus drank in the cup. By becoming sin for us, the Father turned his back on Jesus and willed that he be tortured in our place. Because Jesus said, paid the punishment required by divine justice in full, God can now raise Jesus from the dead and extend forgiveness to all of those confessing that Jesus paid it all. Now, I don't want to mock and get snarky with those for whom this has been a life-giving step. As Dallas Willard say, says, Often we profess things we don't really believe. But even in that professing, we're drawing near to God. So if that tradition has been helpful for drawing near to God, and you're actually living with, sp with spiritual intuitions that are better than your theology, then praise God. But if you're in your soul, you're asking, is that what's really in the cup? Does retributive justice really balance out the scales of justice? Is infinite holiness really satisfied by inflicting pain on the guilty? Is that what God is owed? Pain? Does God need to banish such people forever and ever without end from his presence? Does that feel Christ-worthy to you? And I, I, I say this as an honest question. Does that feel Christ-worthy to you? If it does, embrace it and own it. Wear it for a while. Let it sink into your skin. Does this view of God's justice smell more like Jesus or more like a Pharisee. It will bear the fruit of one or the other in your life. So what do I think's in the cup? A new covenant, the full union of God with us. The older view of divine justice, which the Eastern Church still hold to after the split with the East and the West over a thousand years ago, was that justice, divine justice, is the perfect ordering of the cosmos by God. In the words of N.T. Wright, God is setting things to right. He's making all things new. The reordering is painful. And everything in us that is contrary to the good order of God and resists, resists the good order of God suffers. The false self suffers because it is, doesn't know God, nor the things of God, nor desires the things of God. That is the source of the suffering. Not a retributive punishment, but a healing, a reordering of the divine order of God with us. The cup of taking in all the sin and suffering of humanity is more than mortal flesh can bear. It is more than the human consciousness of whole can hold. I can't imagine even holding the suffering in the totality of my own life all at once. 
how can the human heart revisit all that agony and loneliness? And then to take Peter's and Peter's and Esther's and Steve's and Kathy's and Rick's, Bill's, Lynn's. How can the human heart hold all that suffering? Jesus doesn't just give us a blanket. I'm going to shine like a light bulb on you with my glory and my happiness and my healing. What Christ does not assume is not healed. He enters into the center of our depths, of our hell, of our brokenness, of our woundedness, every single event of every single person, of all who have ever lived and all who will ever live. How do you drink that? How does the mortal mind of man, the mortal heart of man, drink that? The cup is Jesus entering into union with all that we are, our sin, our mortality, our spiritual captivity to death, so that we could be saved through his resurrection and ascension, free to live in the spirit as God lives. Not in general, but every particular moment. What is in the cup? The mercy of God to journey through death, through becoming our sin, and sharing in his resurrection as the head of the human race to bring not only me, not only you, not just a select few, but all creation into the fullness of the union of the one who is love. So we heard in Romans, all of creation groans with earnest expectation for the revealing of the children of God. How does mortal flesh of even the Son of God, Jesus the incarnate, God with us, take all that into himself and not perish and not be overwhelmed with agony? I offer to you the view of the cup, the cup in the garden, and the cup in the communion table as a portion of that cup, like this. The very life of God that is too great for mortal flesh to behold and live. God in his infinitude can take on all the suffering of humanity and fill it with his, and feel the pain with them and fill it with his compassion. Jesus always did what he saw the Father doing. But at this moment, in the garden, in Jesus' life. He has limited himself to mortal flesh. How does mortal flesh take on the infinite weight of the suffering of God and his compassion for us? I do not offer this as an argument that you must believe. I offer it as, as perhaps one explanation of the reality in which we live and move and have our being. Words of explanation will not suffice. We have to live in a habit, a habit of entering into the garden with the Lord and following him into his places of prayer. In the end, we have to drink from the cup of God's life in union with us. Just as Jesus drank from the cup, of his union with our captivity of sin and death. We have to drink from the cup to take up the cross into the places where the world and far too often even the people of God will punish us severely for following him and living the spirit as he does. But there's no other so-called life worth living only the with God kind of life will do. Lord, to whom shall we go? There is no path to resurrection into the fullness of the life of God that does not involve dying to a life that is dead to the presence of God. 
To drink from the cup is to die to the false self in you and to be raised into the true self in Christ. Christ is not just in union with the Father. Christ is in union with all of us into our very real and current condition. He comes to die with us that he can that we can be raised with him. So the invitation be attentive. When you see Jesus entering into the deep places of the garden of your soul, follow him. Follow him in the way he desires to pray within you until it becomes a habit and the habit becomes a custom and the custom becomes a way of life. Be attentive and give your consent to the Spirit's presence and action within you. Be attentive. When you see Jesus entering into the deep places of the garden of your soul, follow him. Sometimes he'll lead you into the seventh heaven and you'll taste paradise. Sometimes he takes us into the depth of the fellowship of his suffering. I urge you not to seek one experience over the other, whether the passion of his joy or the passion of his suffering. I urge you, do not seek to manufacture feelings of one or the other. That's a mistake we often do in Lent. We try to stir up feelings of the passion, feelings of unworthiness, and guilt ourselves into better behavior. Don't do that. Both his joy and his passion, his suffering, are the unveiled glory of the fire of his love. Both will transform you and all creation, entering every wound until all is healed and resonates in harmony with the glory of God's love. Then tears will be no more, but not till then. Be attentive and follow him. Don't lag behind. Don't rush ahead. Don't seek to impress him. But coming up with your own agenda for joys and sorrows, for how to fix the world, simply follow him as he leads. Be attentive. Follow him. And you will not be led into temptation, but you will be led into the awareness of the kingdom of God coming into your kingdom, into the kingdom of this world, separating the ways of life from the ways of death and making all things new. Be attentive. Follow him, in, follow him into the garden. And in the prayers of the garden, and as the Holy Spirit prays within your innermost being, you will behold the heart of the Father through the heart of the Son, sharing in his tears, sharing in his joys. You will know him at a whole new level of being. This is the life in the Spirit. This is to live in the Spirit as God does. Be attentive. Pray with him. Resist the urge of the false self to fight, to flee, to freeze, or to faint. Do not sleep, but become awake and attentive to the presence and action of the Holy Spirit within you. Learn from Jesus. Fishing boats in the middle of a storm are a good time for napping. A quiet evening in the garden. This is the time for meet with God, the Father, Spirit to Spirit. Be attentive. If your understanding of what God is like does not seem worthy of the ultimate divine being, if that image looks a little too much like the power-hungry, ego-seeking, domineering false self of man jacked up in om omnipotent steroids, then I invite you to set that image aside. No matter how much your tradition dogmatically insists that this is what the Bible teaches. Actually, return to the Gospels and behold Jesus. Behold Jesus as he lived and revealed the Father. Be attentive. 
To see Jesus is to see the Father. If your image of the Father does not look and act like Jesus, does not have mercy like Jesus, does not judge with true justice like Jesus, does not restore all things like Jesus, then I invite you to hold that image up next to Jesus. Smell it. Does it pass the smell test? Does it smell like Jesus? This isn't complicated. Any child can do it. It takes years of religious training and the traditions of men to botch this up. I'm serious. With the spirit of Christ in you, ask Jesus for the courage to examine this non-Jesus-like image of God you have been clinging to. Jesus, what should I do with it? Jesus, should I be eating this image? Jesus, is this your van? Or is it the van of a stranger? I cannot convince you that God is always better than you thought, the love of Jesus deeper than you know, and the Spirit is everywhere working the wonders of mercy. With Jesus, you're going to have to take the cup. With Jesus, you will have to drink in the loving, redeeming life of God. You will have to get in the van to get into Jesus, to taste and see by the Spirit of God that the Lord is good all the way down from the highest heaven to the lowest hell. He is with us. He is for you. He will never abandon you. He is your life. He is the light of the world. He's the savior of the world. It is God's good will, it is God's good justice to reorder creation through the death and resurrection of Jesus so that we might all be finally free to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. This is what God is owed. This is what God desires. He's not kept it secret. In him only will you pass from the death of mortal flesh and be raised into the eternal life of the Spirit. So be attentive. Follow Jesus into the garden and behold the Father. Behold the Father through Jesus' heart and Jesus' eyes. Follow him to his table. Share in his fellowship with your brothers and sisters. Make it a habit, not a struggle, not a battle. Make it a weekly habit. Drink the portion of his cup he has willed for you to share with him. Know him in his joys and sorrows. This is Jesus' custom. I invite you to let it become yours. I invite you over these next uh, 40 days between um, Ash Wednesday and Easter to develop some new habits of being attentive to the presence of God, to develop new habits of noticing when Jesus is slipping into the garden and follow him, sit with him, pray as he prays, and the spirit in which he prays. This is your life in the Spirit. And now, come to the table. On the night Jesus was betrayed, on the night he was so looking forward to to share with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it. This is my body broken for you. Jesus has entered into the suffering, into the wounds of all of us. He heals us from the inside out. He reorders us, not through force, not through decrees, not through punishing us into better behavior, but by filling us with his love. He reorders our soul. 
He remakes us in his image. And he took the cup and he gave thanks. He said, divide it among yourselves. Drink all of it. The Lord does not um, require us to drink the totality of the suffering of God of his, for his love of humanity. But he has assigned to each of us a portion to carry with him. To pour out his compassion through us. I invite you to drink it. I invite you to drink his entering into you. That his blood would flow in your veins. And in you to the next person. And to the next person. And the next one living body in Christ. His church. His bride. The new Jerusalem come down from heaven. I'm not asking you to understand things the way I understand them in order to come to the table. However, the Lord is drawing you to the table and to the best of your understanding of what that is. I invite you to part, follow him and participate in that. To take the bread and dip it in the cup. The blue cups are juice. The brown cups are wine. Both are the fire of his presence. Both are his blood beating in your heart, reordering you, giving you a heart of flesh for a heart of stone, giving you a heart of fire <laughs> for a heart of flesh, the very presence of God. Come and eat. Jesus, You are the air we breathe. In you we live and move and have our being. So in the name of the Lord, I bless you. I bless you with the attentiveness to notice the going forth of the Lord within your soul, walking into the broken places, weeping with those who weep, the Lord going forth in your soul, reordering, speaking new creation. I bless you in the restoration of your soul. I bless you as you participate in the sufferings and the restoration of others. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I bless you in beholding the Father as Jesus beholds the Father not through the eyes of the tradition of men, but through the eyes of the Son of God, who alone has seen the Father, who alone reveals the Father. May Christ reveal the heart of the Father in you. May you enter into the garden with him to behold him as he truly is, to love him with the power of Jesus' love, and in beholding, be transformed into the image of Christ. For this is what God is owed. This is what God desires. Christ to be in you. All in all, one body, a living temple come down from heaven, where heaven and earth become one. And all things are made new. If you would like prayer, Ted will be here up the front. Be happy to pray with you. Or grab any of us. We would be happy to pray with you. Go forth in the love of the Lord, the awareness of his presence and activity in you. Amen.